Okay, so this is unit three. For this unit, we actually start to combine the unit one dimensional analysis, sig figs, and the formulas we learned and talked about in unit two into chemical reactions and chemical equations. And so this is where we really start tying it together and getting into um, true chemistry, if you will. Um, so this section, or this video, is going to be on the atomic mass. We're going to start with how atomic mass is calculated, and really that's kind of hard for students usually because atomic mass and mass number are not the same. And from there, we'll go from atomic mass to molar mass in the next video, and eventually we'll get to compound composition, chemical reactions, and reaction stoichiometry. Uh, there we go. So for this unit, this we are going to talk just about the atomic mass. So we're going to learn to calculate atomic mass for an element here. And then we'll look a little bit at how we know um, isotope abundance by looking at mass spec. So atomic mass is the mass that's listed on the periodic table. Um, now, this is a little different from the one I hand out in class. The one I hand out in class looks more uh, like this, but you tend to get the idea. It's um, just a little colored, I guess. Um, that's not what I meant. There we go. So the atomic mass is the one that's listed on the periodic table. Now in unit two, we spent a lot of time talking about mass number. Mass number for us is going to be a whole number because it's equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Atomic mass is not a whole number usually. Um, it is instead the mass of the element taking into account the relative abundance of all the isotopes. It allows us to really save ourselves from doing math all the time. So for example, carbon has three isotopes, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon-14. And if we wanted to do um, a stoichiometric reaction with carbon, we would have to take into account all three isotopes and do the math three times. By allowing us to take into account this average atomic mass, again, taking into account relative abundance, it's not just a sum and dividing, um, we are able to prevent ourselves from doing math for all three isotopes and focusing just on an average mass that we can assume exists. So what we're going to do is focus on relative abundance. This is a little bit different from probably how your text says it, but I do it this way because regardless of which textbook you're using, which site you're looking at, this can be kind of a, a confusing. Relative abundance is basically the percent of time that something is there divided by 100. And so if we're talking about something that's being present 75% of the time, the relative abundance is going to be 75 divided by 100 or just 0 0.75, okay? It's a decimal. So to calculate atomic mass, our atomic mass is going to be the sum of each isotope each isotope's atomic mass, um, or mass number, A, uh, multiplied by the relative abundance of that same isotope. And so we can talk about the relative abundance multiplied by the mass of the first isotope plus the relative abundance times the mass of the second isotope plus the relative abundance times the mass of the third isotope. And eventually you can add up to get the atomic mass that's listed on the periodic table. Now, if you think uh, back to carbon, uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the mass numbers um, in unit two, and we're going to do that again here for just a few minutes. We use carbon-12 as the standard for all atomic mass. We assume that carbon-12, an isotope of carbon-12, is going to have a mass of exactly 12 AMUs, or atomic mass units. Um, Everything else is going to be held to this standard. Um, we're going to calculate it based off 
this carbon-12 mass. So let's look for example. Um, I got this isotope abundance uh, information from the IUPAC subcommittee. Um, and so you have the link down here if you want to follow it. I thought that was really interesting. Every isotope, every, excuse me, every element on the periodic table, I think except for maybe one, uh, has multiple isotopes. And what that means is we really have to take into account the abundance of that. So say, for example, you go to the grocery store and you're looking for a watermelon. Because I tend to be kind of... Uh, I'm a penny pincher. I'm cheap. I want the biggest watermelon for that $5 price, okay? And so I will actually spend uh, several minutes in there looking for the biggest watermelon. Now, in general, they're all about the same. They're all average, but usually you can find one that's like a little bit bigger, and that's usually the one I go with. Um, the same thing happens here. For any atom, you're going to have different size or different mass numbers for isotopes. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take into account all of those different sizes to get the average um, atomic mass, okay? Now, um, for magnesium, magnesium has uh, three isotopes. Magnesium-24 is present at 78.99% of the time. Magnesium-25 is present 10% of the time. And magnesium-26 is present 11.01% of the time. Now, if you go back a couple of slides, we could see that the atomic mass, and I'm going to put it this way. Um, I'm going to put it uh, column-wise rather than uh, horizontally because I think it's going to be easier for you to, to monitor the math this time. Now, to get the atomic mass, we take the relative abundance times the mass number of the first isotope, add that to the relative abundance times the mass of the second isotope, and we're going to add the relative abundance times the mass of the third isotope. Okay? And we can sum all of those together to get our atomic mass. So over here we have magnesium-24, which is going to have a relative abundance so if it's present 78% of the time, 78.99, the relative abundance, this divided by 100, is 0 0.7899, okay? The mass of this isotope is right here. The mass number is listed as 24. Then we have our second isotope that's present 10% of the time, 10 over 100. If you want, you could write it this way. Oops like that. Um, I really don't like that though, so I'm going to actually go ahead and um, write it as the 0 .100. 0 0.1000. 0 0.1000 multiplied by its mass, which is 25. And then we're going to also add this 0 0.1101 relative abundance multiplied by the mass number of 26. Now, if we sum all of these together, you can actually enter this in your calculator just like this, or you could do it somewhat uh, individually where you get a number here, here, and here. Um, like you could tell this would be 2.5, this would be uh, 2 point something. Um, but I'm going to just go ahead and enter it in my calculator as 0 0.7899 times 24 plus 0 0.1 times 25 plus 0 0.1101 times 26. Order of operations is going to do just fine um, in our calculator for that. And you should get something like 24.32. Now, because we're looking at mass, you can say grams um, if you want. And if we look at, now yeah, let's keep the, the things for a minute. Um, if you look at the periodic table, here we have 24.30. Um, actually, I think it should have been rounded up to 24.31, but that's okay. So essentially, this gives us the, um, oh, and remember, guys, I always put the information down here in case you need it um, if you're not listening to the video, okay? 
So this last digit is off just a little bit, um, and that's because these mass numbers may not be exactly uh, what we assume they are. But for us, that's close enough. That's the 100th place, and it's only off by one or two decimals, uh, or one or two numbers. So that's more than sufficient, OK? Another way to look at a problem like this is to, excuse me, um, view the mass number on the periodic table and the presence of one isotope and determine the mass number of the other isotope. <sighs> this is, a, to me, probably a harder problem. So remember, for each of these, we have the relative abundance times the mass of each isotope. We cannot just add these guys together and divide by two. It tells us we have two isotopes, so we're just going to have two relative abundance times their masses. And it tells us our atomic mass. Taking this information, we can plug in what it's told us. We know that one isotope is present 0.6917% of the time, um, and it has a mass of 63. The relative abundance of the second isotope, if there's only two, they have to be present 100% of the time, okay? And if one is present 69.17%, you can just subtract to get the difference. And here we have 30.83%, um, which gives us a relative abundance of 0 0.30. 83 times some mass number, and that's going to be equal, I guess mass number is um, technically the capital A, I'll leave it as M though, um, and that's going to be equal to the atomic mass on the periodic table, which is 63.546. There's a couple of ways you can do this. I tend to like to simplify a little bit. Um, that's just me. Um, and I need to pause so I can reach my... Okay, I have my calculator now. And so we can go back to this math problem. And so I like to really simplify a little bit. And so I'm going to take this 0.6917 and multiply by 63 just to get it kind of out of the way. And that gives us 43.5771 plus 0.30. 8, 3 times some mass is equal to 63.546. Next thing we need to do to get rid of this 43.5771 um, is to subtract that from both sides. There's my decimal. And that's going to end up giving us um, 19.9689. I'm really not uh, rounding. I don't round to sig figs until the end. And that's equal to 0 0.3083 times some mass. To solve for our m, we're going to divide both sides by the 0 0.3083. And hopefully you get something like 64 point eight ish um, because we're looking for a mass number we can round this to a whole number and that's going to give us something like a mass of 65 okay so the second isotope of carbon should be oh, excuse me not carbon copper the second isotope of copper should be copper 65 now, I've given you a whole bunch of isotope information, and the way we get that is by looking at a mass spectrometer, okay? This is an amazing instrument because it allows a sample to come in and essentially be vaporized, 
You put in carbon. You can put in basically anything. And it's going to send it through uh, an ionizing beam, and it's going to allow those charged substances to uh, be propelled. Now think about what would happen if I were to throw a baseball from here, say, to the window across the room. Um, I'd like to think that I'm kind of strong and that the baseball would unfortunately go through the window and give me something to have to pay for. Um, on the other hand, if I took a bowling ball and tried to throw it, um, because that is a heavier substance, um, that bowling ball <laughs> might make it about four feet and then it's going to slam to the bottom of the floor. Um, kind of like if you've seen anybody bowling where they release way too high, it goes up and then instantly falls. Um, so heavier items fall. And that's kind of uh, what happens. So this is kind of upside down. But the lighter substances are going to go up, and then the heavier substances fall a little bit further. And that's going to tell us, depending on how much hits here, how much hits here, how much it hits here, it's basically going to tell us um, how abundant each isotope is. Now, for me, you don't need to worry about the schematic of this. I just think it's important to understand where we're getting this information. If you would like additional practice, I have included this link up here. Here. Um, where you can actually go to this IUPAC information and find relative abundance of, I think, almost every element on the periodic table. And using the relative abundance and the mass numbers, and again, I round to whole numbers, and that's what you can do for my tests. But using that, you can actually give yourself some practice trying to calculate the atomic mass on the periodic table. There's also the um, one or two of these in the sample questions for this chapter, and um, hopefully that will help you out.